Hello, San Francisco. Hey, that was a really cool presentation. I, uh, I'm going to check that out as soon as I get home. Uh, but mine's going to be a little bit shorter, uh, I think. And uh, I'm just going to show a little bit. So I've worked with Nixel a little bit on integrating it um, into our platform. If you're, uh, Raise your hand if you've ever used H2O before, ever in your life. Wow. OK, cool. So we have a pretty you know, popular open source uh, library. It's been around for about a decade. Uh, but we also have an entire suite of commercial offerings. And uh, you know, it's a mixed bag. And I'm going to talk a little bit about both of those. Uh, just really quickly, super quick kind of slide, describe who H2O is if you haven't kind of checked it out recently. So H2O, uh, you know, we've been around the block since 2012, uh, right? So we've had a lot of uh, success in the financial services industry, right? So eight of the top 10 banks, seven of the top 10 insurance companies. Um, we also have a really, really badass data science team. Uh, who's ever participated in a Kaggle competition? Wow, okay, okay, all right. Some people are shy, but it's okay. I've participated in Lost, so that's okay. Uh, so, so when you get uh, to a certain point in Kaggle, right, it's kind of like chess. So you get a certain ranking, yada, yada. The highest ranking is, uh, is Grandmaster, and we actually have the, all of them. We have most of them at H2O, right? So we have the five of the, the world's top 10, and we also have the world's one, two, five, and nine. Um, so yeah, you know, just kind of saying, you know, this is kind of our... Uh, approach towards this sort of thing is pairing technology with really good expert data scientists. And so those expert data scientists inform our product. And so what I'm about to kind of show you is um, really a, you know, a part of there. It's a brainchild. So uh, what we have here is H203, if you've never seen this before. This is open source, completely open source, right? Um, we've got a whole bunch of supervised algorithms, a whole bunch of unsupervised algorithms. The whole thing's distributed. So the whole thing's implemented in a distributed way, whether you're out on your laptop or you're on a Spark cluster or you're in some massive compute, it all scales very appropriately, right? So that's open source. That's been around for a while. Um, the new stuff, and now I'm a recovering chat GPT guy. I, for the last eight months, all I've done is talk about large language models, so I promise this is the only one that's even remotely related to a large language model. Uh, but I wanted to give kind of the history and why this is important for time GPT with Nixla. Right, so you've probably seen something like this where um, you know, you've in encoder, decoder, model, sequence to sequence, trying to translate uh, machine language, um, English to French, that sort of thing. It's been around. Then we got BERT, everybody heard about BERT. Um, and then, you know, the model GPT itself has actually been around since at least 2020. That's not really that new. Uh, chat GPT, as we all know, came along and put a chatbot on it, and we all thought, oh my god, that's amazing, right? Um, and it is amazing. It's a very large model. But the actual concept has been around since about 2020. And then, yeah, earlier this year, we released HOGBT, which is the wor at the time was the world's only uh, commercially permissible open source large language model. So you can actually go out there and use it for your own business on-prem with your data without giving any data to OpenAI. So let's talk about time series, though. I told you that was my only <laughs> large language model slide. Thank God. Um, so with forecasting, um, the motivation here, I'm about to show you a new tool and product we're coming out with. It's a time series studio. studio. It's called Title Pulse is the code name. But uh, I just, you know, I started doing this a lot with customers, right? I started just doing this exact same process over and over and over again in my life. And I started to realize, like, there's probably a better way to do this, right? You get the data, you clean it, you pre-process it, you evaluate, you know, how you're going to, you know, you, you uh, establish how you're going to evaluate performance, right? And then you start training models and start figuring out how to combine things, right? But what if there's a way we can do that a little bit easier and standardize it, right? So that's kind of the motivation of this tool that I'm about to show you. It's called Tidal Pulse. It's a foundational data model uh, and forecasting framework. So basically what I do is I standardize the way we can handle time series data because it's not as complex as one might think. There are very standard things you'd expect with time series data, right? And if you look at like Profit or the Nixla libraries, they all kind of accept the same sort of schema with your data, right? Unique ID, true formatted timestamps, some hierarchical information, and measurement variables. Those are time series that you either want to predict or use as covariates and features in your model, right? So it almost always kind of looks like that. Um, but with the standard data model, what you can do is you basically take your data and you point to those particular things, and then it's standardized. And you can do anything you want on top of it, whether it be Nixla, whether it be Profit, whether it be H2O, any of these algorithms, all of a sudden you can kind of layer them on because everything's already standardized. So basically what I did is I created a Python API that's enabled to do that, right? So you can actually go out there and just take your data and point it to uh, Title Pulse. You can kind of create a data set 
right? So I'm just kind of showing really quickly what's going on there. And you can do things like cleaning it, right? So this is very uh, automatic now, where you can go out and configure a data set, clean it, uh, do time series decomposition if you want. Um, and the whole picture kind of looks like this, right? So this is kind of the flow. And the whole idea is we want to use best of breed, right? There, there are some times where PyTorch really works really well in neural nets, or sometimes where statistical models work really well. We want to use best of breed, and that's what this enables you to do. But the whole flow is something like this. It all sits on top of a standard data model. You've got the pre-processing layer. You always want to do cross-validation. All the models you can think of, and you can build your own and add them if you want. And then how do I combine them? So there's like a meta-learning model on top of that, right? So we built this, and it's currently in private beta, um, just like TimeGPT is in private beta. So I'm going to show it to you just in a second with a little bit of a demo, but just some screenshots. You know, you can basically take a time series, initially understand it, decompose it into trend and seasonality. This is just automatic. You'd be surprised how sometimes hard it is to go and take data and actually look at it in this way. Just to have it all automatic, uh, it, to me, is very useful. Also, automatic feature engineering. So for every time series you ingest into this thing, it's automatically going to do feature engineering on it, right? So this is just um, nine or 10 time series here. You can see the unique ID over there. Gives you some stats on it, when it begins, when it ends, how long it is. But then this goes on forever. So this is thousands of features that you're going to get every time you ingest into the data. That becomes really important for meta-learning after the fact, right? So how to just, like I said, this one's going to be a lot shorter. Uh, how we integrated with TimeGPT? Well, I literally over the weekend took, <laughs> took some code and put it in there. So I made a new model. So you can see here's the list of models that you have in there. Right? And so I think some of the benefits here is that um, you know, with this zero-shot modeling, I mean, there's a lot of possibilities here. So free predictions of exogenous inputs. So sometimes you have a forecasting model that needs inputs as covariates, right? But you don't have forecasts of the covariates into the future. So you can't use them in the future unless you forecast them. Well, guess what? Now you have a zero-shot way of producing some estimate of your forecast and inputs in the future, right? Um, also, feature engineering, right? So using predictions from TimeGPT as a feature in your model could be helpful. Um, and then, so I just wanted to show how well this works. Time GPT seems to work very, very well. I got to say, preliminary results from my testing is, is very strong. Uh, this is a, a forecasting task I often have to solve. It's about a week ahead electricity demand forecast, so it's hourly data, low voltage, so uh, notoriously hard to predict typically. Um, and as you can see here, the, the pink is the actual, and the blue is what Time GPT did. Man, I, I generated this in seconds. It is able to produce things very, very accurately. Zero shot. One more slide. I did a very quick and dirty kind of analysis on this. Oh, it sucks because I'm standing right in front of the time GPT box. But yeah, as you can see here, these are all kind of uh, Nixla's approaches. So I benchmark against Nixla's approaches a little bit for the same task that we're talking about. You can see time GPT was arguably the best, if not the second best, approach. And that was no training. Yeah, yeah clap for Max. <laughs> Yeah, so that was, you know, that was, I, that was pretty impressive. I was genuinely like, oh, okay, that's pretty cool. Um, all right, so, <laughs> so just some thoughts real quick. This is my last slide. Uh, into the future, how can we do this? So like I said, I've, I've been talking about large language models with, you know, h customers for like eight months, and it's kind of really fascinating now to see this in a time series perspective because a lot of the stuff you have to worry about with LLMs, you also have to worry about, and some you don't. So for example, um, quantization or LoRa, if you're familiar with like those sorts of things in LLMs. Basically, you want to make these models smaller so they can fit somewhere else without losing predictive performance. That's something that LLMs are all about. Um, <laughs> how this is going to work with time GPT is going to be interesting to see. Uh, also, fine tuning for domain specific models. So, in the very early days, Bloom Bloomberg did Bloomberg GPT, right? And that was the first one, like, oh, like a financial large language model. That's great. Uh, I imagine that's exactly what's probably going to happen here with time GPT, right? We're going to have energy and finance and that sort of thing. And yeah, we just need some systematic benchmarking. Um, so I will show you just one quick view. Yep, that's who I am. I have to give a quick shout out to uh, a very talented young man named Delu Zhao, who is my intern, who basically built a lot of the backbone of this. Um, so 
shout out to you, Dulu. But this is this is yeah, this is the this is kind of the interface real quick. And uh, you know, I'm not going to do any crazy live demos, but just kind of show you how you can interact. Once you get a data set in there, you can start kind of immediately interacting with it and understanding how it's working. Uh, you can get some visualizations. In the back end, there's an optimized time series database, right, um, that can kind of get you this. But ultimately, you want to kind of build these models and create experiments and rapidly kind of test what works and what doesn't. That's the point, right? You want to be able to try many different things. And so one of which I was able to go out here and try all these different models, including time GBT. And if we toggle off some of these, you'll see, again, that pretty much any way you look at it, time GBT works extremely well. So that is already available within Tidal Pulse, which itself is in private beta. And uh, yeah, we look forward to getting a little bit more feedback on it. But that's it. That's all I got. Thanks a lot.